Hello everybody, my name is Jay. I'm one of the expert PTE academic teachers at e2language.com. What we're going to do in this live class is look at PTE reading reorder paragraphs. I'm gonna give you an extended methods lesson. More specifically, we're going to look at an overview. I'm just gonna teach you what this task is about. I'm gonna show you a method, a step-by-step -step method for how you can actually solve these particular tasks. Then we'll finish up by doing some practice, okay? And we'll use that method in our practice. Just before we begin, if you do not wanna watch this long extended method, you can watch the express methods on e2language.com. They're really short, they're really sharp, and they're really powerful. So you might wanna sign up to e2language.com. Okay, let me give you an overview of this task. This is what it looks like on test A. On the left-hand side, you will see individual sentences that are in the wrong order. What you need to do is drag those individual sentences to the right-hand side and put them into the correct order, the correct sequence, to create a coherent paragraph, okay? There is a method to this madness. When you look at this thing, you think, how can I possibly do that? It's a lot of words, there are five sentences, but you can do it, okay? Just remember that on test day, you'll get two or three of these, and you should spend about one to two minutes on them. People whose English is very good will spend about one minute. Those of you who are a bit slow will spend about two minutes. Try not to spend any more than two minutes, because you need to bear in mind that in PT reading, you have to manage your own time during that section, okay? These tasks are not individually timed. You get total time, and it's up to you to move through those tasks efficiently and accurately. You'll also get one point for a pair of sentences. So let me show you how the scoring works. So let's say you get the first sentence correct. You put D at the top, well done. You will not get a point for this. You'll only get a point if you then put the second sentence correctly and you join the first and the second sentence. Okay, so D and E, you'll get one point. And if you put the next sentence, A, let's say that's correct, well, E and A equals one point, so so far you have two points. And then you put C, well, A and C join now, so that's one point. And let's say B is the final sentence, so C and B is there, and your total score, your total correct score would be four, okay? That's the maximum score for this particular task. But let's say you get one of the sentences in the wrong spot. What's going to happen? Let's say you got D, E, and A in the correct spot. Well done. However, you've put B and C in the wrong order. So the maximum score you can get for this is two points. So you can see how important it is to get every sentence right because it's a difference between four and two, okay? Let alone getting more sentences incorrect. Now that first sentence is absolutely critical to get right. Because if you get the first sentence right, the topic sentence right, it's much easier to get all the rest of them. If you put the wrong sentence first and everything is supported from that first incorrect sentence, then chances are you're going to screw this up a lot. So you really need to focus on getting that topic sentence right. It's absolutely critical. Let's do some practice. I'm going to give you 90 seconds to work through this one here. Just see how you go, and then we're going to learn a method to make it much easier.
how did you go doing that? It's pretty tough, isn't it? Because what you're contending with here is the meaning of each of those individual sentences, because each of them will have a meaning, but then you're trying to think about, okay, how do I sequence them together into a coherent order? So there's a lot going on there. Okay, first thing we need to think about then is what is a paragraph? And to answer that question, we need to think about sentences. What's a sentence? So a sentence is a number of words that develops a single idea, okay? A single sentence has a single idea. Sentences also have some characteristics. They have a capital letter and a full stop. And they also have a, usually, I'm gonna simplify this a bit, but a subject, a verb, and an object, okay? So let's look at this sentence here. A common hippopotamus can spend up to 16 hours a day immersed in rivers and lakes. So it has a number of words, fine. It has a single idea. It has a capital letter and a full stop. And this particular sentence has a subject, a verb, and an object. Most of the sentences in reorder paragraph will be simple sentences, subject, verb, object. Sometimes you'll get a compound sentence that will have subject, verb, object, subject, verb, object. Sometimes some complex ones, but usually just simple sentences, okay? So that's critical to think about. So what's a paragraph then? Well, a paragraph is a number of sentences that develops a single theme. Paragraphs also have some characteristics. A good paragraph will have a topic sentence, which introduces the theme of the paragraph. It will have a number of supporting sentences, and it will also have flow or progression, okay? So here's a paragraph, it's a collection of sentences, a number of sentences that develops a single theme, not just one idea, but now it's a theme because it's a collection of ideas from the single sentences. It has a topic sentence which introduces the paragraph, the theme of the paragraph. It also has a number of supporting sentences. And as I said in the beginning, with reorder paragraph, there's always going to be five sentences, right? So you can have one topic and four supporting sentences. And it also has flow and progression. And this is critical to understanding how to work out reorder paragraphs. How do the sentences connect from one to the next to flow and to show progression of ideas and development? So let's compare sentences and paragraphs then. Well, sentences have a number of words. A sentence develops a single idea, and a sentence usually has a subject, a verb, and an object. Whereas a paragraph has a number of sentences, it develops a single theme, it has a topic sentence, and a number of supporting sentences. It's critical that you understand the difference between sentences and paragraphs here. Because let's look at the method. The first step of the method is to find that topic sentence, the first sentence of the paragraph. Okay, let's look at these sentences here. And I want you to think about whether these would make a good introduction to the paragraph. Another way to think about a good topic sentence is, let's say you've got all of your sentences on the table, right? If you picked one up and just read it, apart from the other sentences, away from them, on its own, doesn't make sense. In and of itself, does this sentence make sense? And would it be a good introduction to the rest of the sentences, okay? So let's look at the first one. Livestock is a huge contributor to emissions, so researchers are trying to develop and promote more sustainable ways to produce animal protein. It's not bad, it's not bad. It's potentially a topic sentence. And this may happen also because sometimes the topic sentence won't be entirely clear. There will be other sentences that will also sort of have meaning in and of themselves. But let's keep going to see if we can find a better one. Let's try B. Despite the benefits, people in Western countries rarely eat insects because they are disgusted at the thought. Uh, again, this is deceptively a possible topic sentence, but let's keep going because we want to find one that's really clear. 
Here's one that is definitely not a topic sentence. One controversial option is eating insects. We can almost eliminate that immediately because what are we talking about? One, one option. Obviously, this links back to another sentence. So we'll eliminate C. Let's look at D. Many people, however, will happily eat a lobster or crayfish despite their insect-like appearance. Again, this one we can eliminate. The word however definitely tells us that this is not a topic sentence. Let's try this one here and think about it in terms of the idea that it introduces or the, the topic or the theme that it introduces. Food production accounts for an enormous 25% of all human greenhouse gas emissions. So A and B are possible, but for me, E is the best clearest topic sentence that introduces this paragraph. So I'm going to move it to the top. And remember, the topic sentence is critical. You get that one right, and the rest of them, uh, it becomes much easier. Okay, we found the topic sentence. We now need to move to step two. And this is where we use our understanding of subject, verb, object, subject, verb, object, how information travels from one sentence to the next and how it connects, how a sentence connects to the next sentence through information. Before we do that, what I want you to do is click the subscribe button, hit like, leave a comment, and please share this video with your friends if you feel like it's helpful, you feel like you're actually learning something, okay? Please click that subscribe button down there. All right, let's think about SVO, SVO. So let's look at how two subjects might connect and share information. So we have the first sentence, Jack went up the hill. There's your topic sentence. So the next sentence might say something like, he couldn't find Jill. We can see how Jack and he, the two subjects connect there. One's a noun, one's a pronoun. Or you might have the subject of the first sentence connect to the object of the second sentence. Again, you might do this through a noun and a pronoun, but this time it will be an object pronoun. Jack went up the hill. It was tough for him. There's how these two sentences connect, subject and object. What about the verbs? Can we connect a verb in the first sentence to the subject of the second sentence? You sure can. Jack went up the hill. The going was tough. You can see how the information from the first verb, went up, is then shared with the subject of the following sentence, the going. What about can two verbs connect? They certainly can. Jack went up the hill. He climbed wearily. Here we can also see that the two subjects connect through Jack and he, but you can also see how the relationship, there's a relationship between the two verbs, sharing information uh, being connected in some way, went up and climbed. What about a verb and an object? So Jack went up the hill, it was quite a climb. So we're using climb here as a noun, and that's the object. So we can see the relationship there between the verb in the first sentence and the object in the second sentence. Or the object of the first might connect to the subject of the second. Jack went up the hill, it was steep. Again, there's a noun-pronoun relationship. Or you might have objects connecting to objects. Jack went up the hill, it was steep. You can see here how the hill and steep are connected in terms of meaning, right? All right, let's look at the one that we just did before. So food production accounts for an enormous 25% of all human greenhouse gas emissions. This is a really good topic sentence. And we can see how the subject, food production accounts for, connects to the subject of the next sentence, livestock is a huge contributor. You could even use that information from 25% in the first sentence, a huge contributor, right? Okay, you can also see a connection here from the object of the first sentence to, it's actually the object, there are two objects in this second sentence, but greenhouse gas emissions connects with emissions there. Okay, we have a longer, uh, more descriptive object, which connects to a, a shortened version, just emissions. 
Okay, here from the second sentence, we have sustainable ways, which is the second object of the second sentence. It's actually one of those sentences that has SVO, SVO in the one sentence, a compound sentence. So in the second SVO, we have sustainable ways. And that connects across to one controversial option. Okay, so there are sustainable ways. One controversial option is, you can see how those two meanings connect. Then we have improves human health and lowers carbon emissions, the benefits. Okay, so that's been summarized. The object of three, sentence three, has now been summarized. Let's just call it the subject of sentence four, the benefits, okay? So you can see it's sort of uh, synonymous language, using synonyms there or uh, sort of boiling it down to a different phrase. Finally, we have people, also the subject of sentence four, connecting to many people. And we have they connecting to many people. There we have the pronoun before the noun. And then finally, we have this sort of idea or this meaning here, disgusted at the thought, linking across to eat a lobster or crayfish despite their insect-like appearance. Okay, despite there is critical because it's contrasting. Uh, you're showing a contrast between being disgusted and then their insect-like appearance. Anyway, they are the answers there. It's 1E, 2A, 3C, 4B, 5D. You might want to put into the comments below what score you got. How many did you get right? Remember that you're scored on the pairs of sentences that connect. So if you got E and A, A and C, C and B, and B and D together, you would get four points. All right, cool. So we've just talked about subject verb object and how information travels from sentence to sentence. Now we'll talk about using reference words and this should not be the main way that you connect sentences. This should just be helpful, right? And it's not necessarily the third step. I guess step two and step three happen together simultaneously. But really the critical one is joining SVO, SVO. That's what you should be focusing on, connecting meaning to meaning. What I'm about to show you is something that can be helpful, but it can also be deceptive and lead you in the wrong direction. All right, so reference words are words like a, an, and the. You can think about how the noun, plural noun hills becomes the hills, or a singular noun, a hill, becomes the hill in the second sentence. Okay, so first sentence, no article, plural. Second sentence, the hills. First sentence, a hill. Second sentence, the hill. It becomes non-specific to specific. You can also look at uh, these pronouns, this these, that, and those. So hills to the hills becomes these or those, that's possible. A hill, the hill, this or that, because it's singular, it's one. Nouns and pronouns are possible. Usually it won't be this easy, but there might be one or two sentences that connect a noun to a pronoun, like the hill becomes it, the hills become they, their, or them at the end of the sentence. Jack becomes he, his, or him at the end of the sentence, or in the object position. Jill becomes she, her, and her at the end of the sentence in the object position, or Jack and Jill become they, their, and them at the end of the sentence. You can also use connecting words which will contrast or show a different pathway for the following sentence. For example, the sentences might be following a particular line of thought, developing an idea, and then there's a however, which will sort of introduce a new idea, or a for example will obviously introduce an example. In contrast, will introduce a contrast. As a result, will reduce uh, an effect or a result. So then you would need to look for that result or the preceding sentence that it contrasts with. You can also have active sentences that turn into passive sentences. For example, Jack climbed the hill. It was then sold by Jill. So the first sentence is active. Then it turns into a passive sentence there. So that is also a way to reference uh, a sentence that came before, okay? 
All right, so how did our sentences, our paragraph use reference words? Well, we had more sustainable ways turning into one controversial option. We have the pronoun one there, more sustainable ways turning into one option. We had improves human health and lowers carbon emissions turn into the benefits. And we also had a, a connecting word there, however, contrasting the people being disgusted at the thought but then being happy to eat lobsters or crayfish. So there's not many in this paragraph. That's why you can, they can be helpful, but they shouldn't lead the way. Again, it comes down to your uh, understanding of meaning and how sentences connect through SVO, SVO. That's how you solve this one. All right, let's do some practice. I'm gonna give you 90 seconds now to complete this one here. All right, and how did you go with that one? It's probably a little bit easier on test day because you can actually move the sentences around and you can sort of put that first one in, think about how it's gonna connect. Here you're doing some sort of mental spatial stuff which makes it a little bit more difficult, but you get the idea. Uh, cool, let's check out the answer for this one. The answer is, 1D, 2E, 3A, 4C, 5B. So let's read through this and look at how it's connected up. So a common hippopotamus can spend up to 16 hours a day immersed in rivers and lakes. You can see that object there is directly connected to the water, the subject of the next sentence. Lumbering out of the water at night, these herbivores graze on tropical grasses and consume 80 to 100 pounds in one meal. That object again connects to the subject of the next one. By daybreak, having eaten their fill, you can see how one meal, the meaning there is connected through similar related language, having eaten their fill. They return to their daytime resting area to rest, digest, and eventually eliminate. The object there actually directly connects again to the subject of the next one. This natural process result in millions of tons of hippo dung entering Africa's aquatic ecosystems every year. Here we can see hippo dung being transmitted or transferred across the hippo's deposits there. However, as distasteful as that might seem, the hippo's deposits actually serve an important ecological function. So that was the correct ordering of the sentences. That's how they connect from subject to verb to object to subject to verb to object. And you can see there, it's really not really many reference words there. There's a common hippopotamus, which then turns into these herbivores, and then the pronoun they, and then this natural process from eliminate. So there are a few, there are a few reference words there, but Trying to reorder this just based on reference words is not the way to go. Cool. All right, guys, if you need help with your PTE academic test in any way, you should think about signing up to e2language.com. We're 100% online. 
How it works is there's a central platform where there's overview lessons, methods lessons like these ones, including the express methods, lots of practice questions, uh, mock tests, grammar lessons, etc. From the platform, you can book one-on-one -on -one tutorials. So if you're having particular weaknesses in writing or speaking or reading, you can, partic uh, you can choose the particular tasks you want to focus on. 45 minutes, you and an expert PT academic tutor. There's also live group classes that happen every Monday to Thursday uh, for those aiming for 65 and 79. So you can uh, sign up and join those live group classes that happen every night. They're very good motivation. And we also deliver speaking and writing feedback as well. So if you do need help, check out www.e2language.com. Cool bananas, I hope that was helpful. Again, if you need any more help, check out the website. You might wanna watch those express methods lessons. My name is Jay, I'll see you soon.